Hey, cannabis business mind, Simone here, your podcast host. I want you to think for a second about what the future of cannabis consumerism and cannabis entertainment is. You know, we've already seen our society move toward this immersive experience, like virtual reality and augmented reality. And then we're seeing it every day. I mean, the Instagram filter, the Snapchat filter, that's a version of augmented reality. We're also seeing these multi-stacked immersive experiences and tours and music, and even at your local exhibit hall. But take a moment and think about cannabis. And where are you consuming cannabis? How are you experiencing cannabis? What pops in your mind? I mean, we're already starting to see these cannabis cafes and cannabis tourism, cannabis lounges. They've been around for a while. Now, these are the obvious, but we'll talk about some very non-obvious ones on the show because, guys, we are at the forefront of what it comes to be of cannabis entertainment. And on today's show, we talk with two partners from the law firm Nolan Hyman, Wendy Hyman Moons, uh, who is this awesome co-founder, woman entrepreneur of the law firm, uh, also a drummer. We'll take a listen. And then we also talk with her partner, Brian Bergman, who we've had on the show before. Now, both of these lawyers are extremely well versed in the cannabis industry and in entertainment as a whole. You know, they really help their clients figure out not only the brand strategy and how to navigate kind of law towards their advantage, but they're very entrepreneurial minded and very entrepreneurial focused. So today we actually talk about what you should be thinking about if you're a cannabis brand, you know, how you can engage with consumers in an effective way. We even talk about what that cannabis consumer is. All right, guys, I am so excited for you to take notes and for you to get some information about cannabis and entertainment. So get that notebook out, get in a comfortable spot and sit back, relax and enjoy the show. Hi. Huh? Good morning. Thank you for having us, Simone. You're so welcome. I'm just really excited. I was telling Brian how interesting uh, the work that you guys are doing is and how so many people might not even have a glimmer, like just a little bit of a glimmer of what is happening as it relates to entertainment, immersive entertainment, experiential, you know, entertainment. And I just am so excited to, you know, Brian's like, oh, let's talk about location-based, location-based experiences or location-based entertainment. So let's talk about it. Where would you like to begin? I guess for anybody who doesn't know what that means, what does that even mean? Actually, my pleasure to talk about what location-based and immersive entertainment is um, because I was using that terminology before anyone really even it hit the consciousness, um, especially immersive. It never passed spell check when I first started uh, uh, doing my work. So um, I love explaining to newbies what it is. Um, the way I describe location-based entertainment, the way it's understood, is any form of entertainment that has a site associated with it where your audience or your end user is is in a physical environment. So broadly speaking, that is theme parks, museums, uh, family entertainment centers, which are things like Dave and Buster's, uh, Chuck E. Cheese, things like that. They're getting more sophisticated, of course. Um, touring productions, pop-up branded experiences, um, thing, pop-up experiences like Museum of Ice Cream, hotels, restaurants, uh, sports venues, any anything that has a venue associated with it. That's location-based entertainment. And immersive entertainment uh, is, is similar in concept, but it suggests a very 360-degree uh, uh, experience within an environment where the narrative or the story is kind of coming at you uh, holistically around you. So that um, that can take various forms and often involves things like VR, Mm -hmm. AR, domed theaters, 360 degree environments, things like that. Yeah, where VR is virtual reality and AR is augmented reality. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm using terms of art. 
Yeah, but what's really neat is, and what makes it interesting to cannabis is that intersection. And as we're seeing it, because right now, the cannabis industry is still very much in its infancy, obviously. We're still um, getting our feet under us as a bit, as an industry and as businesses and everything else. And even for governments that are trying to regulate this, especially here in the United States, where it's still this patchwork of state-by-state state regulatory systems, and there's still federal illegality and stuff. And now we've also have the break up between cannabis and hemp and how it can be treated differently, which I can explain later if you'd like. But what I'm seeing, what's really interesting to me is like, you look at this industry and where it is now and where will it go? And that's what makes this interesting is because right now, as regulation is still being figured out and still being set, everybody in the industry is still looking to transition into this legalized, uh, regulated market, especially here in California. Some other states like Colorado and Oregon are a little bit further along and other new states like Michigan and Illinois are starting to get um, a lot quicker and coming up fast and stuff like that. So what's going on is everybody's still trying to carve out their place. They're still trying to get their position into the industry and get regulated and allowed to be given permission to operate. In California, it's been a long, slow slog, to say the least, with a patchwork of regulations, both at the local and the state level, that make it difficult to know how it's going to work. And because of that slow rollout, you have a lot of businesses that are paying exorbitantly high above market rental rates. They're trying to meet these new regulatory tax burdens, but they're also sitting and waiting to be licensed to operate. So what we're going to probably be seeing first is as we figure, finish up this realm of trying to get licensed and become a business, there's going to be the inevitable failure of many first adopters. Many businesses are not going to make it because they just ran out of runway financially or they couldn't meet it within the regulated market. And we're probably going to see within the next year or so a lot of consolidation and a lot of pickups from bigger companies. And that doesn't necessarily mean big pharma and big, big corporate America necessarily, but there might be some of that as well as the stigma of lessons and as federal regulations change. But until they do, it's still plenty of room for the little guy, if you will, or woman. Yeah. And, and so... What just real quickly, and then just to finish that up, because I can see you have a thought for me on that. It's just what after that gets done, it's the next phase, and that's what we're excited about. It's like once this consolidation and licensing happens, it's where does this industry go from there? Well, the brands, branding, and uh, strategic planning and partnerships become really important in verticals and different ways to monetize their businesses beyond just the selling or transporting and distribution and growing of cannabis becomes a big thing. And then even bigger is what do we do for the end consumer? What do we do with them? All of our out-of-home entertainment right now is based around the bar and alcohol models of entertainment and what people that have been drinking want to be doing. And that's why what Wendy was saying about location-based entertainment is so exciting because what do we do and how do we do this to make it work for the consumer for cannabis? Yes. And I guess let's dive into that because, you know, I think, yes, there's going to be a massive market consolidation. We've already, that, the writing has been on the wall, I think, since the whole industry started. And, you know, the bigger, smarter companies are really focusing on branding and building that consumer-based interaction. And, you know, with the limited advertising avenues that already exist in cannabis anyway, you know, as an event producer, I'd always love doing events a little bit different, right? You know, especially in cannabis in Los Angeles, there had been a ton of different pop-up events, infused dinners, you know, the cannabis cafe. I'm curious to, you know, that's opened. Um, there's been a lot of kind of press on that. And so I'm curious, imagining we're in this like new phase two of what cannabis is going to be, Talk to us about kind of what you're seeing and how that intersection is happening because from a digital perspective, augmented reality, virtual reality just seems like it's completely changing. 2019 seemed like there were so many different changes. There was even an immersive experience in Vegas at the, the Cannabis Museum. So, you know, what are you seeing right now in 2020 with this type of immersive and location-based um, entertainment? Wendy will have a lot to say on this. I'll just note it's still new and they're not thinking about it yet. The regulators are still focused on getting their regulations right, but it's mm -hmm. what's coming next and positioning for that, which Wendy can talk to to, to a large extent. Yeah, so what I'm seeing 
in my world, um, obviously Brian's my colleague that handles the, the core cannabis practice. Uh, I, I'm actually, my practice is, is location-based entertainment in general. And the leading indicator for me within that world is that I'm starting to see concept designs uh, really emanating from that world for the cannabis industry, which uh, is really exciting. So I'm seeing more walkthrough experiences, more interactive um, museum type experiences. But museum is is a not a great word. It, it suggests something pretty old school. We're seeing much newer things. And then in addition, there are already cannabis-based attractions. You you mentioned the one in Las Vegas. There's mm-hmm. one in Colorado. Um, th- th- so we're, we're not yet as much in the execution and opening and operating phase, but we are st- starting to see more business plans and creative concepts emanating from that world. Um, in addition to people thinking about the branded retail experience more um, and what that's going to look like, as well as branded experiences in general. But I wanted to speak to uh, some of the components of the location-based and cannabis intersection because I think we have a tendency to think of those two things together and colliding. Um, But I want to break it out a little bit. I think for folks who are interested in seizing opportunity within the cannabis space, who may be a bit concerned about participating in a way where their business would be regulated, I think that's where some of this out-of-home entertainment gets exciting. So you can think of the ecosystem, as Brian mentioned, as bars and clubs and whatnot, places to consume the product. But I also think there's a subtle, maybe not so subtle opportunity in providing content for the end user of cannabis um, to engage in not necessarily uh, buying or or consuming the cannabis, but once you've done it, once you, you now are in that mindset, where do you go to have fun? And I think out of home entertainment models based on more of a of the alcohol industry gives you a different experience. You know, you, you, you may be in a different mindset at that point and you want to be experiencing different things. I believe that as a cannabis user, you may want to engage in entertainment that's different. And that's where the VR and the AR and the immersive and the very environmental, the projection mapping, things like that, that for me has an appeal towards that type of experience um, and really lends itself. I mean, the old joke is the laser light shows you know where did they go and let's bring them back but let's do it in a, in a next gen 2020 way so what's exciting for me is the economic impact that my world can have as the dispensaries pop up more um, as the entertainment experiences pop up more within cannabis what are the other opportunities that people can can really wrangle to create economic impact in communities and also uh, afford people an opportunity to engage in the cannabis business upside without necessarily selling, distributing, and doing something that's that's necessarily regulated. Yeah, and what's really neat about that is exactly what Wendy's touching on is just how it's not just about cannabis. You might want in, for instance, think of like a shopping center and maybe you have a business as an anchor. That's a cannabis consumption lounge or dispensary because you want to be able to have a safe place for people to go in, consume and feel comfortable doing so. That's not going to be, that can be regulated and also safe and available. But then when they're done now, what are they just going to sit in that cannabis lounge? Are they going to just sit where that dispensary is? No, they can go and do other things in that center that are open to everyone everybody that you don't have to have consumed it just may create an enhanced experience for you Mm -hmm. or it may be something you wanted to go do because now you have out of home entertainment but the reality is anybody can go into these vr ar systems or to these other things and they don't have to only be cannabis focused even if they are something that might be conducive after you've consumed and so the opportunities as wendy was saying and for cities and for other businesses to be able to see uh, about that is it's not just about cannabis. Cannabis is just a potential anchor point to mm-hmm. create these different opportunities. 
And when you, we talk about the economic impact, like how, how, what is the economic impact for entertainment based, you know, experiences? Like, how do we even measure that? More jobs, so, more retail. Yeah, I, I, so in, in my world, we study economic impact all mm -hmm. the time. Um, mm -hmm. It's really essential when you're building something or developing something from a real estate perspective that you prove out to the stakeholders that it's going to have a positive upside, um, your tax base, your job, you know, job creation, um, things like that. And so there are companies that I work with repeatedly that are engaged to do these studies and um, basically map out if this is built, what is going to be the economic upside to your community and what may be some of the negative, right? Um, you do traffic studies, you do environmental impact studies and things like that. But the economic impact really can, can, can be shown um, in, in, in not just in the immediate community, but a lot of times what we find is the economic impact doesn't just create jobs and doesn't just increase the tax base, but you actually increase the attention that your area gets from people who might not otherwise be visiting. So you actually induce visitation to your area, which obviously has a ripple effect on all ancillary businesses that aren't even cannabis related or, or weren't um, developed for the cannabis related area. But it could be something as simple as your gas stations, your, your other retail, your residential values, your home values, things mm -hmm. like that. Yeah. And what we're seeing in talking to, to different folks involved in this is that they are seeing an economic impact. And what's also super cool is we're seeing a negative correlation with crime. And we've talked to law enforcement that shows that um, these things have a tendency to, to drive crime down, which not only has an effect on quality of life and crime, but also economic impact, right? Because yeah. you don't have as much, um, you don't have as much, uh, uh, graffiti or, or nuisance factor, you know, and things like that. So it's, it's super cool. It's community building and it's community building in a, in a much more robust way than just dispensaries, um, popping up. And, uh, yeah, I, you could obviously see I'm passionate about it. Yes. I get very excited about it. Well, it's very exciting. And what I even think about, it's like there's almost these two different ways. And I'm glad that you explained it at the beginning of the immersive, which is the virtual reality, the augmented reality, but then there's just the location based. And I just find that as the more and more we get connected on our phones and we're just glued to them, it makes you feel less and less connected to people. And so I feel like the society in general needs a new wave of connectivity and it seems like cannabis would be just a perfect vehicle to change the way that humans in general are interacting and being able to experience life and society and interaction with one another um through cannabis i mean is that well what, exactly I, I think i think i'm sorry simone to cut you off no, I, I think therein, you really hit the nail on the head. Therein lies the opportunity, and that's why I'm so excited to be working with Brian. And, and, and candidly, that's why our firm was aggressively seeking a cannabis practice. Because mm -hmm. if you look at the analog, again, with alcohol, first of all, humans are social. And as long as we need to procreate, dare I say, we're going to need to find one another. The, 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 the food and beverage industry that's grown up around alcohol creates that sense of community. And uh, that's what it's about. It's saying we recognize that when you, you are enjoying a nice glass of wine or a drink, you want to do it not just at home, but you want to do it in a social environment with other people. Interestingly enough, because cannabis has been largely illegal, cannabis users are, um, you know, we, we, we find ourselves in these little speakeasy environments at best you know, where we're in each other's homes and we're, we're sneaking it. Um, or we're in the alleys, you know, communing uh, in, in very secretive ways. Well, cannabis users are really now coming out and it's, it's, it's becoming okay. And we're saying, you know what? I want to get off my couch. This isn't, this isn't enjoyable for me to just sit on my couch and watch something or get together with my friends secretly or hang out in the alley. 
I really would like an environment in which to engage as, as a social communal endeavor. And, oh, by the way, the current modalities for doing that aren't built for me. And I'll, I'll give you a great story in that regard. I was speaking to a feasibility consultant regarding this area. Um, Brian and I are trying to get more out there in terms of educating the public about the feasibility and the economic impact of these various initiatives. And this particular firm, because they have an international presence, they were a bit concerned about getting too involved before it's legal federally. And then this gentleman said to me, and by the way, our research for out-of-home entertainment in Colorado is somewhat belying your theory, Wendy. And I said, well, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, we've been engaged, you know, by various companies to do traditional uh, studies for traditional entertainment. And we've noticed that since marijuana has become legal recreationally in Colorado, usage of -of out-of-home entertainment is down. And I looked at him and I said, okay, so I'm gathering you don't smoke pot. And he laughed and he said, you're right. And I said, I know that because what you're suggesting is that the experience for someone who's engaging in cannabis, I should be ready, prepared, desirous, happy with just going out and engaging in what everyone's been engaging in since the beginning of, you know, the consumption of alcohol. And that's just not true. It's a different market. It's a different consumer. And I want a different experience. And the big light bulb went off and he said, oh, right, I get it. It's a different consumer. So therein lies the opportunity. And, and that, you know, you hit the nail in the nutshell, uh, and then hit the nail on the head, sorry, Simone. We want to be social. We want to have opportunities to get together. And we want to be able to do it outside of the home. And there's a different component to this as well that maybe gets missed by regulators and by uh, people that are anti-cannabis and or thinking or worried about. They're worried about, they don't like the smell. They don't like seeing that there's people out there like, but the thing about it is if you go and you tell a cannabis user, you can't smoke in here, you can't in- consume in here. That mm-hmm. doesn't mean they're just going to say, okay, great, I'm not going to do it. No, they're going to go walk out, find an alley, or find somewhere else that they can go to be able to sit and you know, consume, and then they'll come back and do whatever they're doing. Uh, wouldn't it be better for the cities? Wouldn't it be better for those involved to know where they are, to put them in a regulated environment with state-of-the-art order control, to be able to be knowing what's going on and to be giving them a safe place to be doing this sort of thing mm-hmm. so that children that are walking down the street may not come across a circle or something like that of smokers? These are the types of things that like sometimes get lost is that instead of being against it it's better to embrace it and figure out since if it's been legalized and put in your state how can we work with these individuals and with these end users that are wanting to consume Mm -hmm. to be able to um, enjoy themselves in a place where they're happy to do so but also where regulations and people can keep an eye on them yeah i imagine that one of the issues regulators might be worried about would be driving, right? So if we all know that all of the consumers are going to the cannabis park and they're maybe going to consume and then have this amazing experience, like how do we make sure that there's not drug driving? And then if you even took that another step farther, like how do you protect people to make sure that not only are they safe from a public safety perspective, but that also people aren't just getting like the the police aren't just waiting to, you know, give out fines and all that. Have you, do you have any, you know, have you had any discussions with regulators? Oh, sure. Mm-hmm. What are the, you know, what are the thoughts there? Well, I mean, the first thing you have to ask right off the bat is how is this any different from somebody going to a bar with their dram shop <laughs> liquor rules and everything else like that mm-hmm. and the insurances that they have to have. Um, so it's already something that regulations have been for a while. And anytime mm-hmm. you are allowing public consumption of a, any sort of mind altering substance, I mean, even caffeine to a much, much lesser extent, <laughs> um, it, you can get jittery and drive funny because of it if you have too much. I mean, let's say if you want to really extend extend it out, but that's mm-hmm. obviously an extreme. Uh, but the idea here is that is a thing. And what we're not seeing is the direct correlation. I, I mean, there's been enough studies on drunk driving that you, 0.08, at least here in California, is an alcohol limit. Is After that, it's been shown that beyond that limit, there's definitely a change in your reaction times and your ability to process what's going on the road. And that's where they've set their DUI standard, driving under the influence standards. Mm-hmm. In California, they haven't really gotten those studies done yet, but that was part of what Proposition 64 required when mm-hmm. they passed the, uh, um, the act to legalize recreational cannabis 
Canvas in 2016 was that there was a large sums of these tax dollars that were supposed to go towards the study of driving under the influence of mm -hmm. cannabis and trying to figure out what it is and how cannabis affects people uh, uh, differently than alcohol and how the effects of cannabis can affect driving and when is too much. When it, what, is, what is that like standard line or at least to align enough where the regulators can feel safe regulating it? So it's a discussion that's very important here in California mm -hmm. and one that they've been definitely looking into. But the studies are not there yet. So mm -hmm. it's an ongoing discussion. And I'm, I'm glad that California is putting tax dollars towards that. That's a useful goal for public safety and something that should help that discussion. But at the end of the day, it's still about personal responsibility mm -hmm. and moderation. Much like you don't, you shouldn't be the, the person who should be first and foremost being sure they don't drive home drunk or drive under the influence of alcohol should similarly not be getting behind the wheel of a car if mm -hmm. they're, um, how much they've consumed has affected their ability to process and drive safely. Yeah. I mean, can I, can I add, add something? So uh, I think it's a really interesting thought, Simone, and it also kind of gets me excited about the prospect because um, you can design into these experiences your concern in that regard. So, for example, we have bars, we have clubs and whatnot that emanated because alcohol has been legal and the notion of drunk driving came later, right? I mean, people were drinking at lunch, at work, you know, things like that. The, the, the con consciousness of the risk of drunk driving came after the development of these various activities. We have an opportunity now as we grow these areas as we grow these experiences to actually build the consciousness of this into the experience. So for example, if a municipality is interested in creating a sense of place uh, for a cannabis user, they can be, they can ensure various things like hotels, you know, places for people to stay overnight in, instead of having to get in their car and drive home or length of stay in the experience. You know, are, are you now uh, a little bit high? Well, we're going to give you an opportunity to enjoy yourself for the next three hours so that you don't have to immediately return home. Or I could even take it a step further and say, let's be super creative and let's create transportation opportunities within these environments. Um, so it's neat because what we can do is we can be proactive about addressing these issues because the infrastructure hasn't yet been built. Um, and all these things can be taken into consideration when you're designing these experiences. Oh, I love it. I mean, it's, that's such a great point is like, let's actually take action based off of, of history. And yeah, I mean, we have seen the main concerns where that wasn't actually ever anticipated with alcohol prohibition. Wow. So where, where, where is this? I mean, so we talked about it. We're in 2020. Regulation is always a little bit slow. California, there's so much stuff going on. Um, where we're, I think, you know, still trying to get a lot of stuff happening, even in Los Angeles. We're in this discussion phase right now of, you know, in people's business plans and all of that. What are you seeing today, if anything, that any cannabis business is doing to kind of engage with their customers from that experience level. It's they're picking it up and they're coming up with new ideas. Um, I think that even before it, it's, it's simultaneous, but mm -hmm. this location based and immersive idea is something that is going to take longer to implement for sure, because cities have to become comfortable and jurisdictions have to become comfortable with the idea and notion that these businesses are good businesses and neighbors to have within the community and that they are not a, a drain and they're not increasing crime and that they're not actually the problem that some fear they might be. Um, and so that's what's going to happen also right now and what's also very important is just your typical traditional brand strategies and marketing and brand stories and what happens with trying to help engage with consumers to create that. Um, you know, the great example is always you think of Red Bull and you think of how Red Bull is an energy drink, but they've also now really identified with action sports and that type of lifestyle and it's become more of a lifestyle brand. Cannabis companies have not done that yet. They have not created the lifestyle stories around their brands and their products and the experiences that they're offering. And so what we're seeing now is these companies in their individual stages that are aware of of this concern that they're now just starting to figure out 
their brand strategies. They're figuring out how can we interact with consumers and with retailers and with other companies to help show and go to that direct narrative. And Mm -hmm. what we're seeing right now is you're seeing a lot of um, strategic partnerships with uh, um, influencers Mm -hmm. or celebrities as they try to, um, you know, maybe say, well, this person has this strain out there. But I think that that's kind of a slower model. That's not really going to be the big thing. It's more like when you get these influencers that are actually talking about it as a lifestyle as a whole and looking at it in other ways that cannabis may be useful to the uh, consumer or just the public beyond just um, the effects it gives. I think that that's still not really been touched yet. But then they're also trying to create brand experiences. They're trying mm-hmm. to do pop-ups and mm-hmm. dispensaries. Mm-hmm. Uh, education of the uh, proverbial bud tenders, those that are at the dispensaries, actually providing the products to the patients and consumers. Uh, those are some of the things that we're seeing right now. But like mm-hmm. I said, everybody's still so focused on just staying afloat yeah. that we're still waiting for that regulatory settling and licensing to then really focus on it. But that is the next big thing, brand awareness, brand strategy, Mm -hmm. and how do you, you know, create other verticals of profit. Are you thinking about starting a cannabis business, but not actually sure where to start? We've got a lot of great and affordable resources to help you get your business started on Calagia.com. That's K-A-L-O-G-I-A.com. I'm sure Wendy has a lot more on this. We're really focusing on uh, more holistically is the intersection of, of entertainment and cannabis because we view cannabis as a lifestyle. And um, so I, I, I really believe that branded experiences, uh, the brands, and not just cannabis brands, but I think we're going to start to see traditional brands who really want to penetrate the cannabis consumer market start to fund some of these initiatives. That's going to be real risky on their part, and we're going to have to look for, for some brave brands initially. But I think that's going to start happening, and that's going to, I think, create going to create more uh, capital opportunities. I think there'll be some strategic partnerships and and whatnot. So it's not just the cannabis brands; it's any brand that wants to penetrate this lifestyle market, create content for it, things like that. Um, Yoga concerts, exactly. Hiking. I mean, like, there's there's so many, right? I mean, there's the health and wellness. Then there's the whole baby boomer population. I spoke with a cannabis brand. Uh, a few weeks ago. And I was like, tell me the most interesting thing you've seen in a dispensary. And she's like, oh, there's just like loads of senior citizens getting bused to dispensaries. And this was like a little bit south of LA, right? And so you think about dissecting the cannabis consumer. And I mean, there's the adult use consumer or the recreational, and then there's the medical, and then you dive deeper into each of those. And the brand experiences, I mean, like I'm envisioning this like huge hierarchy of what that experience truly can be. And I think that, you know, it's unfortunate. And I guess it makes sense that companies have not been able to focus on that. Um, But they will. I guess my question. So Simone, you just gave me. You just gave me a great idea, and we should all cut each other in on it if, if we can make this happen. <laughs> okay. I think we should approach, you know, there are, there are senior living companies that are really proliferating all over, creating these wonderful um, uh, late life opportunities for people to enjoy themselves in a, in a communal environment. And, you know, a lot of people feel like it takes 20 years off them because all of a sudden they're back in their fraternity or sorority in their 70s and 80s. Why not do a strategic partnership with a senior living uh, community for seniors who are cannabis users? I I really believe that there is a cohesive sense of community among cannabis users. And wouldn't it be neat to spend the remainder in your life with people who, who, who engage with you and then develop programming and whatnot in those centers um, based around that lifestyle. That's, that's the kind of thing that, I, that, that Brian and I are really talking about is, is those light bulb moments where you say, oh my God, of course, it's a lifestyle, it's a community, and let's integrate those and, and improve the quality of life and, and um, business opportunities. 
and it's yeah. all walks of life and it's also trying to find exactly. where there's potential that you wouldn't even think of it um you know i mentioned exactly. yoga a few minutes ago or concerts those are some of the more obvious ones but there's everybody has a different need for it some people like to get creative and introverted so maybe there's some mm -hmm. real branding and things to be done more along that side of the coin you know then there's other people that want to be more social and have things that are out and about uh and everybody's at a different time of their life and you know one thing that wendy said to me the other day that really resonated is i may be feeling intellectual and introverted one day but then the next day i may be feeling like i really want to be getting out there and you know being being around people and such so being able to brand and focus on these different experiences and having stories to be able to tell or provide ways in which your companies can work with that is it's an untapped market right now oh my gosh and it's so exciting i mean you just think about it with tech it's like the user experience right you yes. when you're building any business you have different archetypes of who your customers are and like even one i was just thinking about is like you know the opioid crisis cannabis cbd has been proven to help with the opioid crisis you could create an experience for people that are leaving or going through that journey of getting off of opioids and how cannabis can be you know extremely beneficial to them I mean, it just shows this is where people need to go, or brands need to go. Yeah, wow. and, and we're going to see, again, it's so exciting for me to participate in an industry that is in its infancy because we're going to watch it grow, become more intelligent, become more sophisticated, and there's just so much opportunity beyond, as I keep saying, beyond what people currently see as the industry. Um, and, and this market segmentation this notion that all cannabis users are that, you know, the sit in your basement, listen to, I don't know, prog rock and uh, look at black light when you're in your 20s. And that's probably dating me, shows how old <laughs> I am. Then. But, um, you know, this notion that that's the cannabis user's psychographic and, and the experience we want is just absurd. Mm -hmm. But that's still, I think, the way it's perceived. And so there's a real opportunity to give consumers in more discreet um, segments, experiences that they want, that they really need and, 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 and desire. Um, so content creators, I think there's just so much opportunity there. And, you know, the veteran population, because mm -hmm. of, I've learned so much about that constituency and their needs. Um, uh, it, so it's, it's, it's really neat. And it's, it's totally untapped from an entertainment perspective. Oh, and so a social exciting. justice perspective. That's the mm -hmm. other thing. It's not just entertainment. This industry has been very forward thinking with respect to social justice issues as well. And so there, there's plenty of unique opportunities. And it's not just that. It's There's gender opportunities. I mm -hmm. think I've mentioned to you before, Simone, that mm -hmm. uh, I feel that this is one of the first new industries out there where women have not only the technology and the education, but also the access and the availability that I feel like this is one of the first industries that does not have as much of a glass ceiling in place, if you will, because it's equal for everybody and everybody is in equal position to come in right now with the same levels of expertise, yeah. no matter the gender. And to me, that's that's huge. Um, and, and there's a lot of transgender and other LGBT issues I've definitely been seeing coming with the industry as well, not to mention social issues with social justice and um, and social equity and the like. And it's so it's it's not just entertainment. It's also being able to create experiences around social justice as well. It's just a very unique and exciting industry that has a lot of potential. Oh, it's, and we're just like at the very beginning of it. We you know? sure are. It's like we've had conversations about like, if we're on a marathon, like what mile are we? Where do you guys one. go <laughs> in the mile? Brian, I'd say one, one to three, mile one to three. We're still <laughs> really early. But what's cool is unlike a marathon where you have to pace yourself, I see that the the, the the pace of the runner in this marathon is increasing with speed. Mm. So I think the, the how much time it took to get to mile three is not representative of how much time it's going to take to get to the next, you know, marker six uh, or marker nine. I mean, I think we're going to see an increase in velocity mm. in the speed of this, which is super exciting. Too. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but there's still the big bugaboo in the room for at least the United States, which is the dichotomy between the different states and the federal government and the lack of banking, bankruptcy protections, the lack of uh, EPA and FDA um, uh, 
studies on the health and safety benefits of things like pesticides and consumption and everything. I mean, mm -hmm. they're starting to do it now with hemp and CBD products derived from hemp, but they still haven't really even figured out if it's safe to consume for humans when it's hemp derived CBD. And so we're still in this slow process right now of cannabis is not being dealt with at the federal level. It's not being given protections. These mm -hmm. businesses are being hit with exorbitant federal taxes because of IRC 280E and the fact that they're being effectively taxed at almost 70% of their gross income as a result because yeah. they can't get the deductions that other businesses can get. And they have other regulatory hoops, like for instance, at the state level, you can't just sell a license. You have to go through these whole ownership changes within the entities to even try and transfer control. And so there's all these extra hoops that are mm -hmm. still being done that is slowing down the growth of the industry right now, which it'll take time, but that's why we're not seeing a giant downhill um, boulder at this point. Uh, it, it's kind of a little bit of an up and down thing right now. Yeah. And, and, and I think that until there is a clear position and change on the federal level, I don't know that we're going to see a major, um, a major increase in speed just yeah. yet. Yeah. Well, hopefully soon. Okay, are you both ready for the speed round? Of course. All right. I think so. <laughs> you are ready. I'm not going to ask you anything crazy. Um, so where, Brian, do you think the industry is headed in the next 18 months? Um, I think we're going to see more of what I described at the outset of the podcast, which is I think we are still, especially here in California, which is where I'm based, so that's where I have the most experience um but we're still in this uh regulatory implementation stage and i think for the next 18 months that's still going to be the case i think people are still just trying to make sure they are licensed and permitted to be operating and learning how to operate within those regulatory schemes and making sure that they can stay afloat um, i think that we're going to see a lot of uh, failure and consolidation over the next 18 months and that it's going to look slightly differently um, and a lot of people that are around right now, a lot of businesses that are around right now may not be around in 18 months as their runway to pay these exorbitant rents, meet these high taxes while there's still an illicit market out there that's undercutting them. And until that can get uh, regulated better. And, you know, California, for instance, is doing great things to try and affect that. There was a bill that was recently um, proposed to actually create very stiff financial penalties for landlords that rent to uh, illegal businesses as a wow. means of deterrence uh, for these illegal businesses because if they don't have shops to operate out of, it will help the black market. They're doing QR codes so consumers can see if it's actually a licensed shop before they walk in. So we're still seeing how do we attack the illicit market? How do we create tax levels that are going to actually um, you know, allow these businesses to thrive and make sure that it, the monies are going back to fund things such as um, driving under the influence research and things of that nature and who's going to be around. So I think we're still in that stage for the next 18 months, two years. Um, but when we get past that, that's when I think you start to see the industry maturing. Excellent. Wendy, what is one piece of advice you wish every cannabis entrepreneur had before they walked into your office? Oh, good question. I think I think this goes for any entrepreneur, um, and I and I'm seeing it because we have so many new folks that we're seeing in this sector, and it really applies. And and it, I think it's that um, it's not it's not just about having a great idea. <laughs> you you have to have an execution strategy. I think what I see in my world, because my world is so driven by um, intellectual property and and creations and whatnot, is that you know, if you have an exciting idea, that's great. But dare I say, and I hate to sound like Debbie Downer, um, so do most people. Yeah. And so you really have to get past some of your, um, your, your ego and your ownership and what you think is a great idea uh, or a great opportunity and really drill into what is my business plan? Who's on my team? How does this make money? How am I going to operate and execute? I mean, that, that's, it, that's really, I think, what, what the first piece of advice is I would give. That's great and advice. don't get green fever. Yeah. <laughs> which just to define what green fever is because it's so common is we've talked about all the great opportunities, but if you come in with a good idea, 
implement it. Focus on that first. Don't immediately start taking meetings and other ideas and going, well, I can go this way, I can go yeah. that way, because you're just going to stretch yourself out and your resources out so much that you're not going to get anything. You're going to be left with a bunch of half controlled things instead of one thing that you can do well first. Yeah. And, and I think if I that's can, important. I'm sorry, so I know this is supposed to be a speed round, but I really want to underscore that. I think having a proactive strategy as opposed to being reactive is critical. And I think what, what I'm learning about the green fevers, witnessing it through Brian's practice, is that most people are just so giddy with the potential, they're just being reactive. And I think that's going to really bite people later. I think people have to be much more um, strategic. I always like to joke that cannabis used to, it still may be considered by many to be a gateway drug, but I look at it now as a gateway business. You have a lot of people that are seeing opportunity yeah. that um, don't necessarily know how to implement a business, but they need to understand this is not an industry where you just come in and start making money hand over fist. In fact, it's going to take longer than most industries because yeah. of all the regulatory hoops you have to go through. So it really becomes important to go to what Wendy said and really have an execution strategy and stick to it. Think about what is my story? What am I doing? And is anything I'm taking a meeting for, does that further that story? If it yes. doesn't, don't do it yet. Or run the freaking numbers. Like, I mean, as the numbers person is like, okay, you've got this good idea. Let's map it out first. Plus with all this stuff, does it even make sense? Like, do you, are you that passionate about what you're really trying to do? And will it really give you the return that you really think? Because I don't think people do that. And it just drives me bonkers. <laughs> um, it really does. Okay. So two more questions. Uh, we don't have a crystal ball. This is for both of you. Uh, Brian, you want to take it first? You can. Um, when do you think cannabis will be federally legal not implemented but federally legal oh that's a hard question to answer um it's very hard because it still is a political issue in many respects. And so governmental control seems to have a large effect on it. Um, the easiest way I can show you just right now, and I am not taking a side, I am not endorsing one side over another. This is purely mm -hmm. factual. We recently had uh, the industry crowing back in September about Congress passing the Safe Banking Act, mm -hmm. which was supposed to be an act that was supposed to allow for banks to more effectively and easily uh, interact with state legal cannabis businesses without federal interference and so that the banks weren't afraid of losing their federal charter um it was it died in senate so far and that's a and, and and that's because there's a different party in control in senate right now and i don't know whether or not that is because of party lines or what it or not but i will say that it you're not going to see it as one giant descheduling like everybody's hoping it will be. Uh, it's going to be pieces here and there. And I think that over time, it's going to start to create a, a, a sort of like a, of a momentum that's an avalanche that's not going to be able to be stopped. So the fact that if they can just focus on pieces at a time, banking being a crucial first piece so that there's a safe place for businesses to hold their money and to conduct business, that's a very positive step in the right direction and then working to maybe discuss whether rescheduling is the issue but that's that is going to require more time because of the studies that need to occur before mm -hmm. any true change will happen so maybe focus on other things such as veterans access mm -hmm. uh, because of the opioids crisis you know maybe the um, groups in need that might be able to benefit from this as a, a different way to go about it that way so if, instead of trying to go for overarching reform which seems to be knocked every single time we've seen it come out maybe piecemealing might be a way to see more effective change over time. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you say crystal ball, how long? I don't know. My, I'm, I'm hoping five to 10 years. Okay. Great insight. Wendy, what about you? I was, I was going to say 10 years. I, I, I think, I think we need another 10 years, which will go by in a blink of an eye. And that'll be just in time for me to retire to my little senior pothead <laughs> palace. <laughs> Hopefully sooner. Like I said, the idea is to see things happen over yeah. time and, you know, little changes are all positive. And it's already been, if you even think about it, just look five years ago and how much has changed in the last five years. We, we have an amendment in place that actually protects against federal enforcement against state government from spending perspectives. We actually have had it legalized in many more states that were in the last like five years when it, towards maybe more than half the country now. Um, yeah. And, and, you know, we are seeing these proposals for banking reform. We are seeing these different um, proposals happening. So it's not that things aren't happening. It's just 
it's a lot of hurry up and waiting. And yeah. I know that can be well, very frustrating to industry watchers. I, I think that's also a good nuance is, you know, we have 50 states, right? And so even if it's not legal federally, which of course has significant implications, it still doesn't preclude a majority of the states from doing it, which is going to be a game changer also. Yeah. I just, you know, if 280E reform and banking, if there's some way for any of that to, to happen before 10 years time or even three to five, that would allow so much more opportunity for businesses to thrive because they'll have more cash and they'll be able to kind of just run like a business. And then some of the, the cannabis regulation will also just kind of, as you guys both mentioned, just kind of pass the phase of like getting into it and, and, hopefully a little bit of tax restructure at the state level too. Yeah, right. or on the flip side too. Sorry, I interrupt. Yeah. I'll let you go really quickly. But um, at the state level, I mean, there's also other levels on the flip side, bankruptcy protections, oh, EPA gosh, and right. pesticide um, studies. Yes. Um, these are things that can we can push for now that even though it's still, um, you know, those could even create better protections to make this happen over time. That'll also help to show the federal governments uh, and the different agencies that there are things that can be done by pieces. And so yeah, that's absolutely. I just think that's a better so way can to go I, about it. Can I throw a silver lining thought that I just had yes. about this uh, that non-federal um, legality? I think what it does is it affords an outsider community a, a real chance, you know, a la the social equity thought, you know, it, it affords an outsider um, the opportunity to really lay claim and seize this opportunity because people who are on the inside, quote unquote, you know, they can succeed in a more uh, uh, corporate traditional environment. And the cool thing about entertainment has always been that it attracts a certain outsider. Couple that with cannabis and then you have people who may for whatever reason maybe they're tatted out maybe they're pierced maybe they didn't go to college but they're smart and they're 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 totally suited to be uber successful maybe this is their opportunity because you know the lack of federal uh, legality precludes some more traditional folks from getting involved and i would like to believe that it kind of opens the doors for opportunity to others who might not necessarily have a traditional opportunity and me being um, always communing and, and being sympathetic to outsiders. I think this is something we should view as a silver lining. Yes, I like it. Uh, Wendy, let's start the last question with you. You know, we think about, I'm sure with the entrepreneurs, you both hear so much about somebody's why, why they, why they've done something, why they've created it. You know, Wendy, you're one of the founders of this, of this law firm. You're very passionate about all of the work that you do. What is your why? Uh, well, honestly, I think my core why is helping create, helping people create. I, I think ever since I was little, I was a creator. Uh, as I grew, I recognized that that wasn't my core um, competency, that I wasn't uh, remarkable as a creator, but that I was quote unquote remarkable at helping people as an advocate and as a strategist. And so I'm really passionate about applying my kind of uh, core competencies to help creators manifest their dreams. I mean, that's truly what what motivates me at, at my core. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And Brian, what about you? What's your why? What's my why? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it, it, obviously, I'm very like-minded to Wendy. Uh, it's partly why we're partners. Uh, <laughs> but it is true. I, I, I really do enjoy the opportunities, and I just enjoy working with people that are so excited about engaging in something new and helping them to see those goals come to life. And it's just, that's what satisfies me. And that's what's exciting is just, you know, finding myself in a new industry where there is so much optimism and so much ability for social reform and change and bringing in so much that we talk about as a society that are so important and then helping them implement that and being able to do so in a safe and effective way that's actually going to protect them in the process. I'm just blessed to be a part of it and actually working with so many of these businesses and seeing them grow and change. It's just been really exciting and I don't know many attorneys that can sit there and talk to the fact that they're doing something new 
all the time and mm -hmm. learning with their clients too as things change and with the regulators. Everybody's in this together because nobody knows where it's going and nobody knows how it's going to all fall out. And so it's just fun. Yeah. And Simone, can I just add a little layer to this? Um, you, you asked about my why and Brian's why, and I wanted to talk about um, our firm's why because I think it really illustrates our personal whys as well um, and really also reflects why we're so passionate about cannabis and entertainment in the intersection. I think all the folks at the firm and the reason that my partner and I started it is we recognize that there was a certain um, – bravery in staying true to who you are and being authentic. We also recognize that there's, there's, there's power in doing your business that way. And a lot of law firms, I think because they're comprised of risk averse people, it's just natural to the practice of law. Most law firms don't really think about embracing uh, authenticity and allowing people to stay true to who they are and succeed maybe despite who they are. And that's really our why, is we really would never want someone, one of our clients, to lose their why, right? Mm -hmm. So our why is actually helping people understand, identify, embrace their why, and then staying true to it at every step of the way, including your legal work, including your business planning work. Um, it's really critical. And so uh, maybe our Uber why is helping people stay true to their why. Yeah. And it's not about us telling you, no, like you can't do that. It's just, okay, well, how do we work through this? Yeah. Well, and that's what everybody needs. I think that when you can empower others to achieve success and guide them that way, it's just one of the most rewarding things. That It is rewarding. Do. It is. And also letting people know that they can succeed, not be, despite who they are, but because of who they are mm. is really powerful. And I think we're seeing such an opportunity to do that in the cannabis space. I think I'm, I'm meeting folks through Brian for the first time who I would bet a lot of money are people who in traditional paths met roadblocks mm. and are now given an opportunity to do something for themselves without those roadblocks. Um, even if it's something as superficial as meeting folks who are not college educated or mm -hmm. who are tatted out, you know, who uh, things that traditional uh, industries would look at and immediately assume they can't succeed. And what we're seeing is we can create opportunities for folks who've been um, underestimated to really succeed. And to me, that is like awesome. That mm -hmm. is awesome. You know? But patience oh, yeah. is a virtue <laughs> <laughs> and a necessity in this industry. Yeah. How can listeners find out more about your firm and connect with both of you? Well, we have a website. It's uh, nolanhyman.com, N-O-L-A-N-H-E-I-M-A-N-N.com. That's always a great first place to find us. Mm -hmm. um, Wendy and I both speak in our various industries at a lot of different events and everything on a regular basis. Um, and we do a lot in, with the industry. Um, I'm also usually very out and about in events in Los Angeles for cannabis um, issues. And Wendy, I'm sure you've got a lot more. Well, I was just going to say my band would kill me if I didn't use this as an opportunity to plug. Come in to see Crinoline. I play drums, so if you're interested in engaging me as an attorney, I'd really appreciate it if you come out and see Crinoline first. It's C-R-I-N-O-L-I-N-E. -C -C -I -I -E. Go, Wendy. Yes. And Wendy, shoot me the link, and I'll put all of your the website links and your guys' LinkedIn profile as well in the show notes. But uh, definitely, Wonderful. I didn't know you were a drummer. Very cool. I'm a drummer. Yes. It's um, Super great. it's my little secret that's tending to get out there. So oh, well now it's out there full force. Wendy, Brian, thank you so much for joining Cannabis Business Minds. This has been an incredible hour of really learning about cannabis, the intersection of cannabis and entertainment. And I hope that we can connect on the show again and get an update about anything innovative that you're both working on. And I'm sure our listeners will have a lot of questions. So thank you so much again for joining Cannabis Business Minds. Anytime. And they're welcome to email us with questions. I think you have that as well. This is your host, yes, thank Simone you, Simone. I can't thank you. If you haven't already, 
connect with me and other cannabis entrepreneurs online at www.cannabisbusinessminds.com. Super cool website where you can get to meet other people, share your expertise, and also listen to the podcast straight from the site. And if you like this, please make sure you head into wherever you listen to podcasts and add Cannabis Business Minds to your feed and leave us a five-star review. Until next week.